Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled How to Tame High Cognitive Load in E-Learning. This session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to our on-demand recordings page. Additionally, if you did register through our free events website, uh, we will be sending out the recording link to all of those who have registered, so just keep an eye out for the email. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI Division of Continuing Education. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about our e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our summer quarter, which begins June 24th. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Connie Malamed. And at the end of her presentation today, we will have a brief Q&A session if we have time. And finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, we will have a tech support person logging in shortly. So you can send a chat message over to John from UCI support. In the meantime, before, as we wait for him to log in, feel free to send um, a message in the chat panel over to me, Lisa, and I will try to address that and help you out. If you have a question for Connie regarding the content of this presentation, feel free to submit it in the chat panel. I see that we already have um, some people participating, which is nice to see. Um, please feel free to send your message to all panelists and attendees. That way, everyone logged in will be able to see your message, and hopefully we can get a, a good dialogue going, over, going on over there in the chat panel. Here's a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment, and more. As a student in the program, you'll get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in online learning community forums, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, individuals who are currently new to e-learning instructional design, training managers, coordinators who may already uh, be in the industry, HR professionals, individuals who have taken on a training role within their department. If you currently deliver face-to-face instructor-led training, your company may be asking you to switch to e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students should be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate program is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better as well as a completed declaration of candidacy and request for certificate form. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I usually advise students to take a few classes in our program before they declare, just to make sure they want to complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of six required courses. The required courses are listed below. Principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools. Students can choose between the intro and beyond basics version of designing and developing interactive e-learning courses. Project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the e-learning instructional design practicum. Each course is 2.5 units and will run for six weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the principles class and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking courses in this sequence is beneficial. And please note that there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must, you must successfully complete all of the prior required courses before enrolling in the practicum. In the upcoming summer 2019 quarter, we are offering principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, project management for e-learning professionals, and the practicum course. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $660.
Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student services office at the number provided. We do encourage um, students to enroll early as classes tend to fill up quickly. Each course in our program costs $660, so you're looking at a total of $3,960 in course fees for the six online courses. Now, you don't pay the entire total up front. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, you're looking at just about $4,000 for the entire certificate program. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Prior to enrollment in the practicum, Students must purchase or otherwise have access to and gain working knowledge of an authoring tool such as Articulate Studio, Storyline, Adobe Captivate, or other. So therefore, software may be an additional expense. And I'd like to specifically point out information about a special discount that we offer for the program. We offer 10% off course fees to members of ATD San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles chapters. So if you are a member of any of these chapters, please feel free to uh, visit the chapter website for more discount information. Here's a screenshot of our online course schedule, which has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any of the available courses by clicking on the green online button. And where you see to be scheduled, that indicates when a particular course is scheduled to be offered, but registration just hasn't opened up yet. And as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you will want to plan accordingly. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest presenter, Connie Malamed. Connie is a freelance learning experience designer and publisher of the eLearning Coach website and podcast. She is an author, speaker, and workshop facilitator in the fields of, e of learning experience design, design thinking, and visual design. She has helped nonprofit, government, and corporate clients improve performance by creating meaningful learning experiences for more than 20 years. She is the author of Visual Design Solutions and Visual Language for Designers. She was honored with the Guildmaster Award for 2018. And we're very excited to have her logged in today pr to present on the topic, how to tame high cognitive load in e-learning. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand um, the presenter rights over to Connie so that she can go ahead and share her slides and begin her presentation. Connie, can you hear us okay? I can, thank you so much, Wonderful. Lisa. And I'm so impressed that you were able to pronounce my name. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Hi, I promise everyone. you, I promised you that I would send it, I say it correctly. You were so <laughs> confident <laughs> and, you, and you came through. Great. Hi everyone, it is so good to be here with you. Um, feel free to chat and say hi in the, in the little chat window. If anyone's having trouble finding it, um, you can, well, actually you need the chat window to let us know, but I'm guessing you can find it. So anyway, um, we're going to start with uh, how to tame high cognitive load in e-learning because you hear a lot about cognitive load, but you may be wondering what is it exactly and how can I avoid it and help my learners do a better job. So cognitive load is more or less based on uh, information processing theory and information processing theory is I'll give you a great definition. It refers to the transformation of information through memory structures that are postulated and are not physical. So one thing that's really important to remember that although we are guided by this and information processing theory affects and influences our instructional design, everything that we're going to be talking about is a theory. Now there's been a lot of experimentation to say, yeah, this seems pretty true and it's pretty accurate. However, there are no physical corollaries to the structure or, or structures to the things that we're going to talk about. So no one has looked in the brain and said, oh, there's long-term memory. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that there isn't a long-term memory. It just means that, um, there are no physical structures to correspond to what we're to the theory that we're talking about. 
As far as instructional design goes, it's good to know about three memory structures. The first one is the sensory register or sensory memory. And that is where sensory input comes in through your senses and it gets registered in sensory memory for a very short time. Then the information passes through working memory. And we're going to talk about the characteristics of working memory, but basically it's a corollary to when you're online. It's where you manipulate information. And finally, on occasion, information gets um, encoded into long-term memory. And the reason I like to use the analogy of a funnel is because so much information comes pouring into us and only a small amount gets retained or encoded into long-term memory. Attention is a very important aspect of information processing theory because it facilitates the selection of information that we pay attention to. And Attention allows us and helps us allocate our limited cognitive resources. So if you think of our attention as something limited, we can't pay attention to everything at the same time. If you've ever been around um, three little children and they're all asking for your attention, you know you can't pay attention to each individual request at the same time. Well, it's the same thing when people are learning. If a lot of sensory information is coming into your, through your senses. It's difficult to pay attention to all of it. So our attention allows us to select what we want to pay attention to, and that's called selective attention. So we, pay, we often pay attention to, first of all, our survival, something you might be listening to a great lesson, doing a great e-learning course. If your house is on fire or if the school building is on fire, that comes first. So survival comes first. But after that, we use attention to fulfill our goals and to meet our goals. Those are the things that we pay attention to foremost. So let's talk a little bit about working memory. What we pay attention to what we select to pay attention to goes into what we call working memory. And working memory is where we manipulate information. So I like to call it, uh, compare it to a computer. It's where we are online. Working memory has a very limited capacity. And you can see what the capacity of working memory is if you try to multiply two two-digit numbers. While you're doing that, you just about reach your limits of working memory. So it's got a very short, capa limited capacity and a very short duration, somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds. And that's why if someone gives you their phone number, you have to rehearse it and repeat it before you put it into your phone or before you write it down. You have to say it over and over again because you know we, we know these things, we may not stop and think about them, but we know that our working memory is so short that we'll forget to do something or we'll forget a phone number if we don't rehearse it. Now, long-term memory is, I guess you could say almost the opposite because essentially it has an unlimited capacity. No one has ever seen the end to long-term memory. No researcher has said, oh, the brain's filled up, I can't remember anything else. And long-term memory stores information in what cognitive psychologists think are structures that they call schemas. And schema theory is really fascinating. So let's take a minute or two or three minutes and try out something about working memory. I want to show you how working memory works. So please take two or three minutes and just read these seven fun facts about the brain. Don't write anything down. Just read them over.
Maybe you can let me know when chat when you're finished. Okay. A few people are done, so I'm going to say that's good. Great. By the way, all of that information went into your working memory, and it's often the way e-learning and stand-up training occur. An instructor or an instructional designer will present people with a bunch of facts. Okay, now back to the presentation. Schemas are theoretical mental structures that cognitive psychologists think we use to organize and store knowledge about concepts. And people tend to represent them something like this, kind of a network of knowledge, so that if you know a lot about something, you're going to have a nice, coherent network of knowledge. And when you're learning something new, you're going to have one schema over here and another schema over there. And let me show you an example of my schema. Okay, so I'm imagining that this might be what my visual design schema is like. I think about visual design, I practice visual design, I read books about visual design, I've written books about visual design, I'm super into it. So I'm going to have a nice complete network of knowledge and it's so easy for me to learn more, I just fit it right in there. Now stop for a minute and think about something that you know really well. It could be raising two-year-olds. It could be a hobby that you have. It could be running. It could be instructional design. There's, there are quite a few things that by the time you're an adult, you have a very coherent schema about. Now for some reason, I cannot remember the rules of American football. So I'm guessing that my schema for American football looks something like this. I just have little fragments of information. Now stop and think about something that you know very little about and perhaps something that you have difficulty remembering. You have maybe little fragments of knowledge. They're not networked together. So it's really hard to continue to learn about it. So if I watch the Super Bowl, once every two years, and if I ask somebody what's going on, they might explain a rule to me, but I have no network of knowledge to fit that rule in. Stop and think for a second if you have something like that. Maybe you can write that down in chat. Something where you just don't have much knowledge. So anyway, <laughs> car mechanics, right. Um, we take what's in working memory, and when we have a nice network of knowledge and can fit it into the, um, what we know in long-term memory, that's called encoding. We encode information, we encode skills into long-term memory. And to get it out, oh, I just skipped a slide, hang on. There we go. To get it out of long-term memory, it's called retrieval. And this is why we can get around having a small working memory, because we immediately bring up information, retrieve information from long-term memory. Now, cognitive overload happens because working memory is very vulnerable to overload. Not long-term memory, but working memory, where we manipulate information, it's very vulnerable, vulnerable to overload. Try saying that quickly. And that's when we hit the situation that we call high cognitive load. High cognitive load actually leads to poor comprehension and cognitive load actually obstructs our ability to learn because our working memory is so overloaded, we can't take in any more information. And that's why it's a problem. 
Now, I asked you this before, but think about what you were learning in school. What imposed a high demand on your cognitive resources? What made you feel that, oh my gosh, my brain is going to explode. I cannot remember one more thing. I cannot deal with one more problem like this. So I'll wait a minute and, <laughs> and chat. Oh my goodness. Tertiary protein structures. Yes. AP. Yes. And you know, it's kind of interesting, but these subjects come up a lot in this presentation. So it's the sciences, it's math, and it's learning a new language. And I think as we go through this discussion, you're going to see why those topics, why those subjects cause high cognitive load. And it's all based on cognitive load theory which was formulated by John Sweller. And I don't know if you're familiar with um, a podcast that I have, but I just interviewed John Sweller. So if you really like this cognitive load stuff, you, will, you would love hearing it from the person who developed the theory. And it is called the eLearning Coach Podcast. And I think it's a great resource for this presentation if you're interested in that. And um, someone else just... Christy just also mentioned that she was having trouble with uh, language too. So here's what cognitive load is. It's the total amount of mental activity imposed on working memory in any one instant. So science, math, learning a new language. Here someone's mentioning art history. All of those subjects for these individuals imposed so much mental activity on working memory in every instant that it made it very difficult to learn. And here's the key thing that John Sweller talks about. Cognitive load and our working memory is affected by the number of interacting elements. So it's not just that you're getting a lot of information, it's that the information is interacting with each other. And I want to get into that more. So working memory, it's thought, can handle around two to four interacting elements. And that's why when we're multiplying two digits by two digits, we almost max out. I have to kind of draw it with my hand to, remit, to be able to do it, mentally draw it in the air to, to do that kind of multiplication. Also, it's important to remember that a person's level of experience affects overload so that a novice learner is going to have a much harder time with interacting elements than someone who is an expert in the field. And you'll see why in a bit. So let's talk a little bit about what does John Sweller mean? What do cognitive psychologists mean when they're talking about interactivity? Well, here's an example. I can learn 10 different functions in Photoshop and nothing will, that, and if nothing interacts, it's no problem learning them. I can learn how to crop an image. I can learn how to change the background. And all of those things are separate, so there's low interactivity. However, if I have to learn how to adjust the brightness, contrast, lightness and color tones and how they all affect each other, that would be a highly interactive elements and that could overload your working memory. Here's another example and I'm going to ask you to supply the answer. Let's say you're in um, a healthcare profession or taking science courses and you need to know the parts of the circulatory system. So I'm just talking about memorizing the individual parts of the circulatory system, the components. You don't have to think about anything interacting, just memorizing the parts. Can you give me an example of what would be, in chat, what would be high interactivity in terms of the circulatory system? What would overload someone's working memory? <coughs> oh, 
Those are great. Especially the one about the models, because models usually have things interacting. How blood flows in the body, you're going to have to understand all the different parts and how they interact. Yep, how these parts work together and with other systems. So you get the idea. Um, I suggested how components interact to cause high blood pressure. Any, all of these are correct. Anything that causes a lot of element interactivity is going to cause high cognitive load. And in that um, conversation with John Sweller, he stresses that and explains how that works. He gives a lot of good different examples. So cognitive psychologists talk about two types of cognitive load. Intrinsic cognitive load, this is imposed by the difficulty of the learning task. So if your assignment, you're in a nursing or medical school, or you have a job and you're getting on the job training, and you have to understand how the parts of the circulatory system work together. There's really not much we can do about that. That's a difficult learning task. However, there's also extraneous cognitive load, and this is controlled by instructional designers. This is imposed by the manner in which information is presented to learners, and this is the one that we have control over so we can control the manner in which information is presented, the manner in which um, people may have interactive activities, if we're talking about e-learning, um, how we handle our multi the multimedia in e-learning. So all of this we can control. Now here's the ideal. Of course, it, you can't really ever 100% only have intrinsic cognitive load and with no extraneous, but we can reduce the amount of extraneous load that we put on, that we impose on learners. So let's look at how this happens. Think about e-learning that you've seen, maybe e-learning that you designed, maybe um, you've had to design any kind of training or you're in school for it now or you're thinking about being in school for it. What bad practices do you see that add extraneous cognitive load to a learning experience or maybe even just in classroom training? Can you answer that in chat? And let's get some more people to answer. Too many concepts on one slide, yes. Especially if those concepts interact. Using 20 words with seven will do. Okay, another good one. Providing too much detail that is not necessary. Busy visuals, not including a review. Information in text and audio and, and in the diagram. Using terminology inconsistently and inaccurately. Now oh, these are great. No custom learning paths for learners, so um, it doesn't matter what role, what user role you are. Too much jargon. Excellent. So you, everyone here is like right with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Giving historical info that doesn't matter. Yeah, sometimes I'll tell my clients we don't do history. <laughs> Not enough application of the information as you learn. Read and click. Read and click. Okay. Excellent examples. I'm going to borrow some and no kittens. Yeah, that, that's always a problem. So what you just explained is often what I call and other people call fire hose training. It's just these intense information dumps with no consideration for our human cognitive architecture, for our working memory, for our sensory memory. With no consideration of that, we just get fire hose training. And that's what this is all about. We want to avoid ever being responsible for fire hose training. Now let's think about our working memory. Remember those facts you learned about the brain? Can you write in chat how many of those you can honestly remember? 
because that was fire hose training. Excellent. So just think about that. So often, e-learning, stand-up training, YouTube videos present tons of information at people, and really most people are remembering one or two things. And it's kind of interesting, because often the thing that you remember is something that kind of was surprising, or it was novel, or it shocked you. Like that the brain has a lot of fat. That one kind of shocked me. I didn't know that. So anyway, this is something to remember when you do want people to remember something. Think in terms of what did you remember? You remembered something that was novel, shocking, fascinating, interesting. If you can take all the concepts that you want to teach and present them, in one of those ways, you will help people retain the information. So let's look at some ways that we can reduce extraneous cognitive load. Any extraneous mental processing increases cognitive load. One thing that cognitive psychologists recommend is to enable schema construction. You help learners construct schemas to free working memory capacity. So the way that that works is that experts are going to have whatever you are expert in. You're going to have a nice network of knowledge. Therefore, when you call information up from long-term memory, you've got this nice, compact network of knowledge. It's not floating all over the place. It's not overwhelming your knowledge. It's not overwhelming your working memory, sorry. So what are some ways that you think you can help learners construct schemas? If you have any ideas, yep. Someone got it right, Courtney said. Analogies, yes, analogies are one way to help people enable schemas. Put it, organizing information, yes. Organize, organizing information into categories. I'm giving learners a chart or a table to fill in as you go. Using advanced organizers, which is a list of what people are going to, a framework of what people are going to be learning about. Activating prior knowledge. Those are four great things. Provide students with, with notes, literally draw lines. That's a nice visual way to do it. So I have here two suggestions that have already been mentioned. Connect what you know, connect what you're teaching to prior knowledge, and use analogies. When we use an analogy to help us understand a concept, a long time ago, when computers first uh, became popular and people were buying them at home and people were trying to figure out how did they work? How did word processors work? People would always compare them to um, a typewriter. And when people were first learning about databases, people would always compare them to a filing system. As soon as you mention an analogy, people begin to understand what you're talking about. And if you link it to prior knowledge and people already have an experience, as, as someone is saying in chat, then people have a network of knowledge to fill it in with. And I'll often in my e-learning or in, in my writing say, recall, recall that in the previous lesson and repeat it so they can connect that, connect the new information to the old. Scaffolding is another way to avoid and reduce cognitive load. You, pro you provide full support at the start, and then you intentionally fade support over time. So if you're helping someone prob solve a problem, um, do a diagnosis, evaluate something, you provide full support. 
You tell them all the criteria at first, and then you continually give them um, problems throughout, let's say, an e-learning course until they eventually can do it themselves. So what your first, so one approach to scaffolding is omission. First, you provide overarching supportive information. And in, let's say you're providing realistic scenarios or branching scenarios, you omit some of the element interactions and then you add them over time. So if you're doing customer service, you provide someone with a realistic scenario that's pretty simple. You've given them the, the supporting information of how to help a customer, let's say with technical support. And you have calls come in, but the calls are pretty simple at first. And eventually over time, you make them more and more complex with element interactions such as, here's the problem, here's the operating system, Here's the action that someone did, and all these things will be interacting together. So that's another way to do scaffolding. Another way is to give people worked examples. You demonstrate how to solve a problem step by step, kind of like the first one I was talking about. Then you provide a sequence of examples that fade support over time. So you may say, um, the person did step one and step two. Here's what step one and step two are. What would you do for step three? And then your next one would be, here's step one. What would you do for step two and step three? So the, all of those are approaches are examples of scaffolding. Um, I did a course once where they were teaching doctors how to discuss medications with patient to make sure that the patient knew how to take them. But they didn't want to insult the patient. So there's, there's a certain soft skill technique to getting the patient to talk back. It's called the talk back technique. So at first, you would model how to discuss medications with a patient and then slowly fade out the steps and let the learner fill it in. Another approach is to automate schemas. So when you automate schemas through practice, it frees working memory capacity. And a great example is learning how to read. When you have a little one who's trying to learn to read, their brain is overloaded with phonics and expression and, and just trying to figure it all out. And now you don't even think when you read. The same with driving. When you first learned to drive, it was not automated. So cars coming at you, cars to your right and left, all the mechanics of it were overwhelming your working memory. Then when it becomes automated, you can talk to the person next to you, follow uh, Google um, instructions, and you can integrate so many things and hopefully be safe while you're doing all of this and while you're driving. This is kind of fascinating to me anyway. When something is automated, it's not consciously processed in working memory. And that's why automating schemas reduces cognitive load. Because when you're driving, when you're reading, it's not conscious, be, consciously being processed in working memory. And one of the main ways you can help people automate things is to give them a lot of practice over time. And I know there's a lot of, um, maybe there's some negativity in our field about giving people lots of practice and drill and instruction, uh, drill and practice, drill and practice. But that really is one of the only ways that people can automate things. It doesn't mean that they have to do it all at one time though. And in fact, there's research, a lot of research that shows that spacing the practice over time, two weeks here, then give it a little bit longer, three weeks. Spacing practice over time is one of the best ways to help people learn. Does anyone have any comments about scaffolding, automating schemas and whatever the other one was? Do you have any comments or questions? I'll just wait a minute and um, see if anyone has anything to say in chat.
Okay, I know what this means. It means that I'm so fascinating that you just want me to continue on. All right, I will. There we go. I didn't think that was true. Um, it makes me think of Duolingo. I think they do a good job with scaffolding. <laughs> I know. I, I agree. Um, Duolingo is a great, I think they do a really good job. There's, an, there's another um, tool called Google Primer. It's just a little mobile app, and I love the way they present information. I think it's about marketing. Um, let me see. This is helping me understand why I have no working memory at times and how to fix it. I know, because I used to feel, until I learned about working memory, I was like, I felt bad about myself. I would be upstairs, go downstairs to get something and forget what it was. And then once I learned that working memory is so small, if I started thinking about something else, I was going to bump out the thing that I was trying to remember because you have to rehearse it. Um, here's a question. Is automating schemas considered to be consistent with problem-based learning or in conflict? Mm, I don't think I know the answer to that. I mean, I think let's take someone who reads x-rays or someone who repairs cars. Um, if they do that enough or if they go through enough problem solving, then perhaps it would automate schemas. You know, if they were doing like simulations of car repair or simulations of um, diagnosing, reading an x-ray like a radiologist does. Um, but I think they would have to do so much problem-based learning to um, make it automated that I don't know if you could do it you know, unless maybe you continued something complex for a very long time. So I don't, just from, you know, I, I haven't seen any research on that, but to me, I think that it would not be inconsistent. It would be consistent. But I just think you would need a lot of that problem-based learning. Uh, maybe you can look it up and see if you find an answer and shoot me an email and let me know. Duolingo does spacing and retrieval practice well too. I agree. Duolingo is a, a very good model. Um, one challenge that a lot of the organizing schema teachers may use are online apps, for instance. Um, okay. <laughs> Jeanette has, if I pronounced your name correctly, um, that sometimes instead of using apps, sometimes paper and pencil is the best. And there is some research on that, that writing things down is uh, better for remembering and personally i'm super into the paper pencil thing so <laughs> i'm going to agree with that and a lot of times um students in, in school in k through 12 now are given a lot of apps and doing things on their ipads and i do wonder about um always doing things uh digitally it does because the research shows that writing things down can be good i guess the, i guess the future will tell us so let's look at this graphic. Someone mentioned a complex graphic. This was an information graphic I saw. It was the evolution of web browsers and technologies over time. I thought that this graphic would cause a high cognitive load in a viewer. And um, if you agree, why don't you write down why you think it would cause a high cognitive load for viewers? Write it down in chat. And if you don't agree, you can write that down too. It's not clearly understood, yeah. It was really busy and hard to take in. I'll go back to it. The background line is, is distracting. Yeah, you know, and, and another thing, there's this thing in visual design called a, um, visual hierarchy. And that's when we guide the viewer's eyes and tell them what to look at first, second, and third. And there's no guidance here. You don't know where to look first. So I think I would start out with some instructions or a small portion of it and then get into it. Do the intersections mean something? Um, don't ask me, I don't understand it. <laughs> you can look, look for it and uh, see. Play around with it and see what you think. Evolution of the web browsers and technology. But don't look now because you're going to miss some fantastic stuff. 
So let's talk about the split attention effect. I think anyone who is in multimedia probably is aware of this or has, or has at least heard of this, and this causes high cognitive load. Notice the viewer doesn't know whether to read the explanation down below or to watch the animation. So you're watching an animation and then you're trying to read it down below. So what can you do to avoid splitting the learner's attention? Well, I think I'm going to tell you the answer because um, I don't want to run out of time. You can present the words as narration rather than on-screen text. So if someone was speaking the words and explaining what was going on the screen, there would be no split attention. And there's another possible approach too that we're going to see um, here. You can also put the words in the diagram itself, but this, this does cause a little bit of a problem because of cognitive overload, because of the transient information, the information passes by too quickly. Let's look at it again. So what can you do when an animation is too fast for learners to process? What do you think? Why don't you write your answers in chat? Allow the learner to control the pacing, yes. Add speed control and pause, yep. And it's amazing how many times people do not add that to their e-learning. So we have to give learners a way to stop the continuous flow of transient information. Another idea is to divide it into short segments. Ask, and someone suggests ask a learner to answer. Yeah, and intersperse it with interactions. And provide user controls. Great examples. Looks like I'm uh, preaching to a captive audience that already knows the answers to these things. So, Whenever information, we have to watch out for transient information. It can be an audio, it can be visual. And give learners control. Make sure things don't fly by too quickly. Now here's an interesting one that you may not have heard of. It's called the expertise reversal effect. Remember previously, recall previously, in a previous slide, we were talking about how to solve a problem step by step, the worked example. And I said that when you're doing a worked example, you can provide a sequence of examples then fade support over time. Well, if someone is an expert or fairly competent something, fairly competent, as their knowledge increases, worked examples may interfere with problem solving and that's because they have their own ways that they are solving problems. They've figured out how to solve problems. And if they have to read your guidance and integrate that with what they already know how to do, it can cause confusion. It can overload their working memory. So the guidance is, the recommendation is to reduce instructional guidance for experts. So it's great for novices. Worked examples are great for people with a low level of knowledge. When someone has a high level of knowledge, they often need very little guidance to solve a problem. So here's the theme for the day. To reduce cognitive load, reduce unnecessary mental processing. Now, let's talk in chat. What about something that you're working on now? It could be for school, it could be for work, it could be a situation that you came upon. When did you, what is an example of something that you were working on where you needed to reduce cognitive load? I'll wait a minute and you can answer in chat. Because it sounds like there's some experienced people here. When did you come across something where you needed to reduce cognitive load? I did a course for an e-learning program for pharmacists. And the subject matter expert insisted that I filled the screen with text. She said the pharmacists are used to it. And the only thing I could think of doing 
was to break everything down so that they had to click on something to view a, a, a small, um, I broke it into categories basically like someone was saying. Okay, editing down coworkers PowerPoint presentation slides. Yes, I've been through that. That's a hard one. Um, people somehow think that slides cost something, but they don't. You can have all the slides in the world and it won't matter. Um, someone had to work on a detailed security and identity management concepts and processes for Microsoft exams with no interaction options. Oh, I know it really hurts. It hurts because you know you're not doing the right thing. And we all come upon those situations and it's, it's really tough. Restructuring a six week call center, new hire computer systems training. Yes. Um, <laughs> bye Angie. <laughs> uh, when an instructor is talking about tech glitches, and software functionality together, it's very difficult for learners to know what to pay attention to. Yeah, I, I feel like everyone here really is getting the concept of cognitive load and um, that's fulfilling to me. Don't forget to listen to that podcast interview with John Sweller if you really like this topic because um, it was just great. It's just great to hear him talk about it, since he was the one who formulated it. So I wanted to say thank you. Um, do you have the link to the podcast? I think I have it memorized. Hang on. The elearningcoach.com forward slash podcasts forward slash. Okay. I think it was 55, but it might've been 56. There you go. I'm pretty proud of myself for remembering that. Um, any other questions before we go? Thanks. Okay, Lisa has more to say though. So hang <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Connie, for presenting today. Um, for all of you who are logged in, if you have any questions for Connie, we do have a few minutes. Um, feel free to type them into the chat panel. I love how active the chat panel has been during this webinar session. So um, please feel free to type them there and we will try to get them answered. If you think of a question after the webinar is over, feel free to email me. I left my email address here on this slide um, and I can forward them on to Connie uh, to get a response for you. And Connie, if you want to take a moment just to see, scroll through your chat panel one last time to see if there's any questions that um, we may have looked over as you were presenting. And again, I'll leave, let me give you, let me go to the next slide here. Again, feel free to reach out to us um, if you do think of a question later on. Okay, and I do see a question. Someone pointed something out, which was actually might have caused high cognitive load. Uh, Courtney mentions that um, the nomenclature, um, she, she's heard cognitive overload, high cognitive load, and mental overload. And I think that's a good point, um, Courtney, and perhaps I shouldn't have, have used all three. I do hear people talk about cognitive overload, which is the same as high cognitive load. And mental overload is kind of a term that I use to make sure people are understanding what I'm saying. But um, I think it's a good point that maybe just calling it high cognitive load would be best. Okay, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but uh, someone is, I won't pronounce it, but someone is asking about germane load. And in my previous presentations, I always used to talk about germane load. And germane cognitive load is kind of like the cognitive load that is um, that the that the learning task requires people to do, such as uh, memorizing something. And as I started reading more and more um, about cognitive load, I noticed that there have been debates about whether germane cognitive load exists, whether germane cognitive load can be proven. Um, and when I interviewed uh, John Sweller. I asked him that question off the air, it's not recorded, and he said to me, he does not use the term germane load anymore. He doesn't even talk about it. Did not think it was necessary for instructional designers to go there, so I have removed it from my presentation. Excellent question. And I think the preferred term is cognitive load or high cognitive load, because not all cognitive load is bad. Some of it is what you need to learn something, but high cognitive load is when you've taxed uh, your mental resources or the resources of working memory. 
great questions. Really, you guys have been such a fantastic audience, alert, awake, smart, brilliant, experienced. <laughs> it was really fun. Great. Thank you so much, Connie, for all of the information that you shared with us today. For all of you logged in, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and gained some useful takeaways regarding strategies to address high cognitive load. If you um, saw any summer 2019 courses that may have piqued your interest, uh, please remember to register early since our courses do tend to fill up um, quickly. And um, feel free to reach out to me if you want to learn more about our e-learning instructional design certificate program and adding it to your uh, professional portfolio. This slide has my contact info as well as my directors, so please feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you again, Connie, for joining us today. Have a sure. great day, everyone. Thanks. You too. Bye.